the, the problem is is that glazes are weak because food stuff can attack the excess sodium. Okay? So if there's a ton of sodium, it makes it really weak. So if you think about glazes, how they're the weakest, like the absolute weakest are like Islamic turquoise because they are all sodium and then some copper, and that's it. There's no calcium in there. Um, there's very low alumina, and so they're super, super weak because that sodium gets sucked out of the glaze by an acid or a base. Okay? Um, so they're not durable to that end, but to the other end, is there anything inherently toxic about silica and sodium? No. Mm -hmm. So toxic, no, but durable, not really either. But again, you know, can you keep using it? Sure. Would I make an entire body of work and start selling it for the rest of your career? I probably wouldn't. Um, okay. You know, on a food surface, I'd probably use a liner glaze, even on a plate. Mm -hmm. You know, but... It, 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 you know, this is this is this whole toxicity discussion, which like it, it depends on what you're concerned about as far as being toxic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as uh, will come up in this week's lecture, um, you know, one of the more toxic things, quote unquote, that we deal with is copper. But almost no one is concerned about copper. I mean, you'll see people freak out about it online, but. Copper is fairly toxic. Um, chrome is also very toxic, but chrome is even trickier because the version of chrome that we use is not toxic. There is another chemical variation, a different valence of chrome that is exceptionally toxic, and the test can't tell the difference between the two. So it just comes up as chrome in the toxicity test, which looks bad, but the version we use chrome oxide is not toxic at all versus hexavalent chrome, which is what they use for like chrome plating car parts, is very toxic. Mm. Um, you know, we can discuss barium. I, you know, that the toxicity of that is um, much more about the toxicity of the raw material versus the fired material. Um, but we could talk about leachability in the fired material. Again, that's a big discussion. Um, and then, you know, lead, people get paranoid about lead. Yes, lead is toxic if not composed and fired properly, but there is so much lead in China out there that people use every day that they just don't know because it's got good chemistry behind it. Um, mm -hmm. To this day, most industrial China is still leaded because it works great. And as long as the chemistry is good, it's fine. Um, cadmium... Um, actually, uh, Steve Edwards, who is one of the former glass professors, just posted something on Facebook like this morning that was saying that there's a glass company that's going to start producing cadmium colors again um, because they've got their safety standards down. We use cadmium stains all the time with encapsulated stains, which will come up in this week's lecture again. Um, so, you know, is silica toxic? Not in a fire glaze. Alumina? No. Um... Lithium, not particularly. Sodium, not really. Potassium, no. Magnesium, no. Calcium, no. Strontium and barium get controversial. And then the colorants. So what's toxic? It's a very relative notion. Okay. That's a long way to not answer your question. Oh, I yeah, yeah. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Okay. Hi, Beth. Hi. <laughs> you made it. I okay, good. <laughs> Jess, how are you doing? Good. Uh, I got some of those field mouse revisions out. Mm -hmm. That gray glaze. I don't know if you can see them. I uploaded them too, but they don't look as good. Nice. Um, check Blackboard before class. I just did it too. Oh, so. Okay, hold on. Let me pull them up. <laughs> how do you think they look? I think they. I really like the line, but it's cooling at the bottom, so I don't know if it's gonna run. Let's see. What section did you upload them in? Mm. On the message board? No, the. Glaze image Glaze uploads. Image uploads. Okay. Let me screen share this. 
Okay, so talk us through it. Uh, okay, so the top left corner and bottom are the, the original recipe. I just altered the colorants in it. Mm -hmm. um, that's more for my practice. Mm -hmm. But uh, the other two are the two revised recipes you gave me. They're supposed to be mm. better recipes. Um, mm -hmm. And I have them on here somewhere. Uh, I think you added more boron in for me for the second yeah. one. So I don't know if it would run. It looks like it's going to start to run. Right. It's looking like you're starting to get the crystallization out again. Oops. Did you have the formula? Oh, Beth went to the ceiling. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to read it to you. I just got my headphones. It's giving me. Uh, do you have it on your screen? Yeah. Why don't you screen share it? Okay. So green arrow. Open it. Green arrow. Okay. There we go. Can you guys see it? Mm hmm. Okay, so that's the original recipe. And then these were the two. The top one's the more brown one. Mm -hmm. And the bottom one's the one that's running. All right, one second. Let me plug these in. Just one second. Mm -hmm. 17, Analysis of the bottom one. Here we go. Except, let's see. There's that. Okay. Um, so, so this is the one that's running. So fairly low silicon alumina levels. Um, <laughs> Um, slight change in the fluxes, right? So, okay, so we're at a 4.37 to 1, 0.2 to 0.8, whereas your original was, whoops, stop, Jesse present. Can you scroll up, Jess? Mm-hmm. On the computer. There we go. Okay, so she, you were at a point uh, 0.08 to 1, point 0.1 to point 0.9, 7 to 1 silica to alumina ratio. <laughs> F cycle the last tonight. <laughs> okay, so yeah, this one's going to run a little bit because of the increased alkali metals in the increased boron. So the other thing that we can do is, if you want to bring it back into a gloss. Oops, I got to screen share mine. Uh, screen share my screen. 
Um, so if we want to bring it back into a gloss, pretty simply, we can add in some more flint. 20. Oops, that's EPK. Flint. 20. 30. 40. Um, 35. So something like this where uh, it'll tie up some of the excess boron and it'll bring it more into that glossy region where the original one was. Um, yeah. I mean, if the color response is, is really still so off, we can bring back this... this um, um, we can bring the flux ratio back down. So here's, uh, oops, sorry, I'm not sharing that. Here's one variation, um, which is this one. So bringing it to seven to one, which should tie up the silica to alumina a little bit. Um, if we want to bring back down the flux ratio, if it's too out of whack for the color response you're getting, we can try this at 10. Try this at 15. Try this at 10. 5. Oops, that's too low. Sorry, that was uh, 20, 25, 30, 40, 45. Um, <laughs> 50. 51, so then bring up the EPK, because now our alumina level has now dropped. So now bringing the, the flux ratio back in line, so I wanted to make that point, 85, 40, 35, 34. Okay, 0. 0.85, 0. 0.15. We need to bring our alumina level back up to 0. 0.42 where it was, so the EPK is now a little low. So it's at 30, we're going to try 40, 45, close enough, and then the silica level will bring up to back to 7 to 1, uh, 0.33, bring that to 40, 45, 47, close enough. So now we've got this variation, which is slightly tighter and shouldn't run as much, should get you back towards a similar color response. Okay. Oh, wow, it just made that into one big formula. Let's do. Let's just make a space and then space again. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I mean this glaze looks nice. I'm just worried that if I put it in a kiln, it's gonna. Well, um, <laughs> you just have a standard sort of temperature that you fire to, or do you are you are you firing with a kiln a cone sitter or what? Uh, 2228, I believe, is what I do. And so I have a... set and run to that? Yeah, and I have a sight cone in there. Well, like remember, a, a, a glaze runs because it's inherently over-fired, not to say whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. If it's over-fired, we can compensate by either <coughs> a, firing to a lower temperature, but since all of your glazes are working towards that, we don't really want to do that. Um, or B, we can increase silicon alumina to inherently increase the firing temperature. Okay. So then one last variation on just doing that based on what you've got. Uh, screen share again. Okay. So if we go back to your original formula, can you read off the original, the last revision that I had done? It was 30, 60. Uh, Nef size 17, whiting 23, EPK 30, 3195 is 60. Okay, so if, if we just want to take that and increase the silicon alumina to, to bring up the temperature, um, really all we need to do is look at our ratio. We're at a 4.37 to 1. So we start by increasing the EPK. We're at 0 0.41 alumina. So we just want to bring it up a hair. So try 35. That brings it up to 0.45. Now our ratio went down because the silica level went down. So we'll just add in a little bit of silica to bring that up. I'll try 5. Okay, 5 was a bit much. 
try three. Okay, I mean, I'm going to dial this in. 2.7, too low, 2.8. Wait, no, I'm sorry, we were at... Uh, I'm sorry, 2.5. You know, close enough. I mean, I can keep dialing this to 2.4. Close enough. Doesn't really matter. Um, so now we've got inherently more silicon alumina, so then this is just slightly, slightly tighter. Um, and again, you can you can try a few variations on that. You know, so now, although it looks like a radically different formula, it's really just minor variations into... Um, just adding in a little bit more clay and a little bit more flint. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Um, I have more questions for you, but if Beth wants to go, these have to do with my own work. What's happening? So. Beth, do you have an immediate question, or do you want to let Jess keep going? Jess, can you go? All right. Later. Okay. On. So. <laughs> I've been having an issue lately, only like the last month or so, with my clear glaze uh, crazing. And we, Linda thought maybe it was thickness, and it's taking like a week or two for it to craze. It comes out of the kiln fine. And I wasn't all that worried about it until I fired a plate yesterday and it popped. Or I microwaved it. The plate popped? Yeah, it like cracked. Like a shatter. No, it just, no, it's there's a, like a fracture through it. You're using 747? See it? Yeah. yeah. Hold, yeah. On, hold it up again. Hold it up again. <laughs> it's right here. Mm hmm. You're using 747 at cone 6. Yeah. And it's been fine until recently. So I don't know what's happening. Is it the Sheffield's play? Yeah. They started getting 747 from Sheffield? Yep. Yeah. Um, but then this mug I fired after I thinned it out a little bit, and it's fine. But the plates were still crazy. So I don't know. Well, if if you want to get... The easiest answer is to practice getting your glaze as thin as possible. Okay. You know, that is the most simple non-chemical change to getting rid of crazing. I... I hate to say what I'm going to have to say is the next answer, though. <laughs> it's, you're sort of in a bad place. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Good year. Um, because this is, this is the problem with cone 6. It's the problem with using this body of cone 6, but it's cone 6 in general. Okay? Mm -hmm. This goes back to the problem that, you know, that people say that 3% absorption is okay at cone 6. The problem is it's not, because at 3% absorption, it means your chemistry in your body is incomplete. So if the kiln's a little hot, if it's a little cold, if you're in the wrong spot in the kiln, if you've got different glaze thickness, if, you know, all, there are all these different variables okay, that can come into play. And if the body is under fire, you have to remember that part, part of what goes on in the body as it melts is that you're dissolving quartz in the body. Okay, and the more quartz you dissolve, the thermal expansion goes down because actually quartz turned into glass has very low thermal expansion. Okay, and that's part of what happens in the body as you fire it. The quartz that's in the body, whether it's in the form of silica or free quartz or whatever, it melts and reduces thermal expansion. If there is unmelted quartz, unmelted quartz has very high thermal expansion like exceptionally high, like six okay. times more thermal expansion than quartz that's dissolved into a glass. So here's the problem with having a body that's inherently under-fired. If it's under-fired, that means you've got levels of quartz that's undissolved in your body that's giving you high thermal expansion. And because the body is inherently under-fired, it's not even like you can say, oh, I've got 2% undissolved quartz. You don't know what percentage of undissolved quartz you have. Because it's just it's just under fired, and to what degree, where in the kiln is it? How off is the kiln? Is the pyrometer giving you the right reading? All those types of variables are really uncontrollable. 
Gotcha. So, I mean, I see this all the time with working at Cone 6 where, yeah, suddenly, all of a sudden, this isn't working or I'm mm -hmm. suddenly getting crazy and it's sort of uncontrollable. <laughs> um, keeping your glaze thin is definitely going to be um, one of your best defense mechanisms. You know, you can go back and we can tweak the chemistry. Like, we know very clearly how to tweak chemistry to get rid of right. crazy. Right. But mm. because the body is inherently inconsistent, it's right. almost not even worth pursuing. That's what I was That's what afraid I was. of. <laughs> that it was the clay body <laughs> issue. It is. Um, what, what's... Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I just I wish I had a better answer. I, I hate having to. That's all right. <laughs> it's just weird that it just started happening. That's why I thought maybe I did something wrong. You know, you probably did nothing wrong. Maybe your glaze was a little thick. Maybe your batch was a little bit off. Most okay. likely, this is this is the okay. problem with um, with cone six. This is the problem mm -hmm. with the clay companies, that maybe what they're getting from Sheffield is better than Laguna, but Sheffield is still a clay company. They're still not mixing very well. They're still lazy about how they break up their proportions. You know, I'm just assuming. I don't know, but they, you know, I've seen this in many clay companies that they just, right. you know, they've got a staff that's not as well-trained as they could be, mixing up the batches. They're not as careful about getting things exactly right, and that they're need is to get clay out of the mixers and into boxes as quickly as possible. So, you know, it, it's probably just a variation in the clay. Okay. Um, which is why it pops up suddenly. Um, gotcha. Yeah, just try to, try to see, do some tests to see how thin you can get your glaze. Okay. And still have it be a satisfactory appearance. Right. Because thickness definitely affects crazing. Okay. Okay, that's going to be your best defense from here on out. Cool. Okay, another question? Um, do you think that I should like, put things in the microwave, or is that a bad idea? Are you, are you saying it should? Are you saying should you not advertise it as microwave safe? Well, that too. Well, that but... too. But... Sorry. Sorry. No way. <laughs> um. That's a difficult question. Again, it inherently goes to the cone six problem. Right. If you've got open pores in your body and you microwave them, there can be water in there, they can expand, it can pop, it can do all that sort of thing. If the clay is vitrified, it's generally not an issue. Okay. Um, and it's why you know I get so worked up about cone six because right. there are all of these these things that sort of that those that advocate cone 6 will tell you, oh, that's not a problem, that's not a problem. Yeah, it's a problem. It's just, you know, you choose to ignore it. Right. Um, and I know cone 10's got plenty of problems too, but... Um, try glaze thickness for... I mean, so where are you now? You're... Are, 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 you've got all your final pots made? Are you still throwing? I'm still throwing. I'm still throwing. Week. Okay. Do a glaze test, like, do you have some test tiles laying around? Yeah. yeah. Okay, make some tests with just seeing how thin you can get your glaze. Okay. And then figure it out. Uh, as to the microwave, hopefully if you get it thin enough, it'll alleviate that sort of craze evolution. But okay. Okay. I can't say. Take those test tiles, see how they look. Um, you know, one of the best ways, well, the best way to force crazing is to actually put your test tiles in an autoclave, which is a high-pressure <coughs> steam chamber, which would force them to craze. But you can do it by, um, my sort of home version is uh, get a pot of boiling water and a bucket of ice water and just take your test tile and move it between the boiling water, let it sit there for a couple minutes, then move it into the ice water for a couple minutes, and then do that five times. Okay. Uh, and that sort of thermal expansion with water should theoretically help it to force craze, if it's going to. Will it not craze? There, I mean, there are instances where it's, it'll be okay. I mean, are there? 
Oh yeah, you can make glazes that craze that don't. I'm sorry, that don't craze. Of course. And you can still like give them that huge of a temperature change. Oh yeah. And... Because, yeah, absolutely. Re- remember, crazing. Here's the problem, and again, why it comes back to a clay body problem. Crazing is about a clay and glaze mismatch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And and that's why I hate actually the notion of of you know a lot of people go around and say oh well this clay is this glaze this glaze is having a problem it's because the glaze has high thermal expansion that means absolutely nothing because you cannot say a glaze has high thermal expansion unless you know what the thermal expansion of the clay body is because it's literally relative of which one has higher thermal expansion mm-hmm. okay so. And then on top of it, it's you know as we talked about in the lecture on thermal expansion, it's impossible to measure the thermal expansion of a glaze. It literally cannot be done under our conditions. So all you can say is, hey, this glaze and this clay body match well enough. And so yeah, you can totally yeah you can make glazes that sorry I just pressed the mute button. Um, you can make glazes in clays that match very very well and will never craze no matter what sort of stress you put on them. Um, that's not that hard to do. In fact, it's sort of easy to do, but you've got to have a high-quality clay, and then you've got to have glazes that match to it. The clay has to be well-fired, and the glaze, again, has to be designed to match to it. It's, it's not difficult, but, you know, when you've got variables like cone 6 and commercially produced clay bodies and stuff like this, it becomes very, very difficult to control. It's, it's not impossible. It's just difficult. Did you have another question? I don't think so. My only saving grace is that if I want to do something all clear, since it's a cone 10 porcelain, I can always use my cone 10 clear. And yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, you can fire that body up if you want to. I mean, there's nothing stopping you. Um, you might want to test your underglazes, though. Make sure that they're oh, stable. Okay. I mean, okay. if you're still doing a lot of underglaze work for your final pots, just make sure that that's mm-hmm. stable with your cone 10. Um, okay. But again, you know, I, I don't have a bot, a glaze off the top of my head that fits really well with Linda's body. Gotcha. Yeah, because that body, it's porcelains are tricky. That body is tricky. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it tries really hard to get in line, um, but, you know, porcelains have a lot of silica in them, and so that silica can cause thermal expansion issues. Okay. So it's really good to know your clay recipe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you know, clay clays is one of those tricky things because um, we all sort of treat our clays as like, oh, okay, I just need something that I can build with that builds really well for me, and then as long as it doesn't bloat or crack, like, I'm okay. It's not really the way it is. That's just a good enough answer. And so, you know, when it comes down to it, you need to know your clay chemistry because, like I said, um, the crazing, um, shivering, those types of problems are clay and glaze dependent. Um, you know, a lot of the things that clays get blamed for, like black coring or bloat, those are fairly simple problems, like bloat really only happens if your body is overfired. Well, you can tell if it's overfired if you know your composition. Um, you know, uh, black coring is not really an issue the way people make it out to be. I mean, cl- clays are just so filled with even more myth than glazes. It, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, it, it's not hard to dial in. It's just most people don't because it's hard to mix your own clay. Um, Clay chemistry is more complicated because, like, so, you know, we've got Stull and all this wonderful notion of how to manipulate glazes very easily. Clays become more difficult because in a clay, in a glaze, we're just forming glass. In a clay, we're forming two different materials. We're forming glass and mole. So, uh, although Dr. Cardi has worked very hard on coming up with a calculator that works really, really well, it's far from perfect because it's trying to predict two different outcomes in one composition. On top of it, it's temperature dependent, you know, cone 10 versus cone 9 versus cone 6, you know, all these types of things. 
that, that controlling a clay becomes very difficult, and then most people are just buying whatever off the shelf. And Guilty. No, I, I don't even care. I, it doesn't even bother me. I, I have a greater problem with what is being sold and what is being sold as the standard. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, I have major problems with this notion of cone 6 having 3% absorption. Yeah. And I think I've told you guys of, of I had a student over Christmas from England and she called her clay supplier and it's like, hey, what's the absorption on this clay? And even in England, she was told 3%, and that's fine. And it's not fine. It's not. But, you know, that this is what has been sold as, as being okay. And, you know, you have to take control of that sort of thing. Ooh. What? What if we just got a pallet of uh, <laughs> Coleman porcelain at home? I don't. I don't know Coleman Porcelain personally. I, I think yeah. it's generally okay. You Dave Crenshaw speaks very highly of it, so I think. I don't know. Dave usually doesn't say anything good about it. Right. But, but he says he good things about the Coleman Porcelain. So. I've never used it. I mean, I, I don't even. It's know. it's I've, nice to work with. It's really forgiving. Sure. Yeah. I I, I know it's popular. Um. Do I have his porcelain recipe here? I don't. I don't see copy of. So I don't know if I have his one. I have his book. Let me look. Let's see if his book. Um, I mean, here I have listed EPK OM4 Custer and Silica. I mean, so I've got his book here from the library. It's called With a Little Help from it, My Friends. He's got a bunch of different formulas in here. I, I don't know which one is the official Coleman porcelain. Uh, I like found the one on the internet, internet. I don't know how real it is. I mean, they're Drawlig, Custer, Silica, you know. Drawlig, Custer, Nefsi. Hi, little monster. <laughs> Sounds like somebody's got a dirty diaper. Yeah, he's cold. Oh, he's cold. cold yeah, I mean, they're all Drawlig, Custer, and Silica, which actually isn't really that great of a formula, because... Custer's dirty, and he's even using straight bentonite, not even, like, V-gum or bentolite or anything like that. But, you know, if it's good to work with, it's fine. Uh, I'm going to mix my own porcelain. Well, at the end of, no, at the end of the day, that's what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, but mixing up, you know, like, solders are crazy expensive, and they're not even the best possible mixers you can have. Like I think a solder is like five or six thousand dollars. Yeah. Um. Well, I, oh, I don't know what I'm saying that. Let me. Um. Solder mixers. Let's play king. Oh. Yeah, sixty-five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Fifty-four hundred dollars for the new for for the pro model is sixty-five hundred dollars from Clay King, um, and, and that's just an it's an adequate mixer. So most people don't mix their own clays, and I get that. But yeah. then you're at the mercy of whatever formula they're putting out there, and it you don't know what's in there, and it's. You don't have any control over it. You don't have control over the switch material, if the batching was not quite up to spec, if you know, the mixing was not up to spec, you know, that it's very, very difficult. Um, you know, so I, I think you're fine. If you like working with your clay, that's good. If you can mix it on your own, that's even better. I'm going to mix but, it on my own. <laughs> yeah. Most people don't. Most people can't. We have we have we have one of those, and then we you have, have a solder. Yeah, and then the Bailey hug mixer. There you go. 
So. I'm gonna. Well, I should take your clay class. Oh, yeah, I take the clay class. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, you'll learn. You'll learn a lot. I mean, that's that's really what we talk about. I mean, we talk about why temperature is an issue, and why mixing is an issue, probably more than anything. Yeah. In, in clays, those are the two big things. Mm-hmm. Um, what you're really doing with a specific firing temperature, you know, like I, I'm I'm sitting here looking at some tiles for a consulting <laughs> job I'm doing, where like I've got a company I'm working with who their matte glaze is very clearly just an underfired glaze, like. Yeah. Um, but that's that's their mat, that's their texture, so fine. It's not a functional glaze, as we would call it. So, you know, it's fine, and, and in some variations, that's okay. Making pots, uh, you know, that's not really not that's really. That's not okay option. because they're outside and weathering. So okay. If they're not a proper fit. <laughs> they do matter. I, my wife makes oh. works in tile and glazed brick, so she's got her own opinion. That it matters. It it does. It does. But can't cross that bridge. <laughs> Being eavesdropped on. <laughs> um. Okay, Pat. Did you have an, Did you have a question? Did I even get it when you're answering? Me? No, you definitely did. Now I don't want to be owned by by any clay company. <laughs> it's not about you'll, being owned. It's about go, being knowledgeable. You'll own. <laughs> it's about being knowledgeable. You know, it, it's the whole hard thing of, of whatever changes that they made at the university from going from one supplier to another. Yeah. It, that's great. I mean, you know, it's definitely you have to vote with your dollars, and, and there's been issues for years um, with certain suppliers, but it doesn't mean that it's a perfect situation because mm-hmm. everyone's got their own issues. I mean, you always hear horror stories about substitutions that are made without talking to the customer or, you know, um, I remember when my wife used to run the the grinding room of, like, you'd find streaks of different color in one pug of clay. You know, she ran the grinding room? Yeah, she did for a year. Aww. Um, uh, but, like, in, in 747, you would find, like, spirals of other color. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a quality control issue. You know, um... It's tricky. Any more questions? No. Oh, what yes. was that one crazy material in the one Fiesta Wear plays? Uranium oxide? Ah, okay. All right. Oh, yeah. It's, um... Uh... Yeah, it's, it's just uranium orange, um... Uh, I have a bowl I had given to Dr. Cardi, and yeah, I mean, it sets off the Geiger counter. I mean, it, like, goes crazy. Um, it, I mean, it is it is nuclear, but again, it's, I shouldn't say it's nuclear. It's, it's radioactive. Um, I don't know if that'll do that. I'll post the picture. No, I see won't post the picture uh, if I screen share. So, like, yeah, uranium orange. Wow. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it's a random baby picture. I don't know what's with that picture. <laughs> oh, yeah, he has to wear uranium orange. It's uranium oxide. I mean, it's the same base uranium that they use to make nuclear fuel, but it's not. Oh, yeah, here's somebody with a guy your counter going off like crazy. Um, oh, here I can do one. <coughs> Except it's five minutes long. Did he freeze? Oh, did I freeze? Oh, oh, there you are. Oh, is the video not being shared? No. Oh!
It wasn't? Oh, I thought no, I was showing... I can see it. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, I thought I was showing you guys the video. Anyway, so that's a Geiger counter that measures radioactivity. Um... Anyway. So why would uh, they make radioactive pots? Well, radioactivity <laughs> is a complicated subject. Just because something's radioactive doesn't mean that it's gonna like make you grow a third <laughs> eye. Okay, I mean we're we're surrounded by radioactivity all the time. Okay, it's because it makes a freaking cool orange. I mean, <laughs> um. You know, uh, in, in this week's lecture, we're going to talk about how the stains work and how the toxicity works. And, you know, stuff like uranium and cadmium and lead and all that, it, it works great. It's just, <coughs> it's a question of, of how bad it is. Now, the uranium orange has been phased out. Um, <coughs> you know, but yeah, it, it, it came from a time where toxicity, radioactivity wasn't really known. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, Fiesta Ware's whole thing was having really bright colors. Well, that made really bright colors. And, you know, I'll have a very brief section in this week's lecture where I'll talk about all of these colorants that we don't really use anymore, but that make awesome colors. Um, can you use them? Yeah, if you can get your hands on some uranium oxide. You know, it's not like you're, you know, it's not, again, it's not like Marie, Marie Curie levels of radiation. Um, you know, where you can't even look at her notebooks, but is it good for you? No, but you know, it's, I was I was just talking with somebody the other day about I think I, I was at my sister-in-law's, and we were all talking about how when I was a kid, I remember. Okay, so my son is four and a half years old. Okay, today kids are not allowed outside of of car seats until they're eight. But I remember going to preschool with my friends sitting in the back seat of my friend's car and none of us had car seats okay at, at four and a half I remember doing that and now that's like so illegal it's not even funny it, it's just you gain knowledge mm -hmm. you know so don't use uranium unless you want really sweet colors dude <laughs> Any other questions? No. Okay, so I am not up next week, but I'm up the week after. Okay, you guys. So yep. get everything in line. Um, I'm going. Uh, I'm going to stop recording, but don't go away just yet. Okay, one second. <laughs>